I'm going to now introduce our first speaker of the morning, Mr. Jim Steichleather. So now that you've heard about our direction, you're going to hear from him and the rest of our speakers for the morning. Um, Mr. Steichleather is the Chief Information Innovative Officer for Dell Services. The $8 billion IT services arm of Dell is where he's from. In this position, he leads a team of IT and business experts who identify, evaluate, and assess the future potential new technologies, business models, and processes used to address evolving business, economic, and social trends, both for the company and for their customers. For more than 25 years, Jim has designed, developed, and implemented information and communication technologies that help business and institutions succeed. He's an expert in digital infrastructures, evaluation of emerging technologies, and strategic guidance, provides strategic guidance on their applications. Please welcome Jim Steichleather. Good morning, everyone. Okay, let's see if we can get the slides going. Uh, where'd it go? Ah, there we go. All right, I'm going to talk to you. I already have a problem. I can't help but walking around. This is going to be difficult. Um, I do have to start off um, making the comment that uh, Laura asked me if there's anything in the world she could do, to, do for me while I was here. She'd be glad to take care of it. I want you to find out what Misty has for breakfast. I need that on a regular basis. <laughs> OK. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about innovation. And the reason I'm going to talk to you about innovation is that I personally, and, and we as a company, happen to believe that the number one issue that's going to face IT for the next five years is innovation. We're going to have more than enough technology to play with. We're going to have more than enough demand for technology to service. And Lord knows we're going to have more than enough problems with both of them. What we're going to have difficulty with is applying them, bringing them together in new, creative, innovative ways in order to provide services to our customers. Now, to start this discussion of innovation, I want to define the innovation problem for you. And I do this through a video. So some of you may have seen this video in the past. Please don't help your neighbors out. I've never quite done it with an audience this large. It'll be interesting to see the result. But I'm going to define the problem in terms of the 800-pound gorilla that we all know that innovation is. It sits in the room, and we sort of talk about it, but we don't really do a lot about it. Only the problem with innovation is this 800-pound gorilla is invisible. So with that, we're going to watch a movie. Be sure and count. Okay, how many of you are totally embarrassed because you didn't see the gorilla? Yeah, I can see the hands. Yeah. 
it's interesting, particularly in smaller groups, when I actually use this video, nine out of 10 people will not see the gorilla. They're so intent counting those people wearing white, passing the basketball, and by the way, most of them will actually get the, the 15 correct, but they'll never see the gorilla. And that's the innovation problem in a nutshell. We're so focused on budgets. We're so focused on the next technology refresh. We're so focused on that list of service levels that we haven't met that we don't stand back far enough to look at see what's happening overall in the big picture. How are all of these piece parts together? And we totally miss the invisible gorilla that's innovation. So hopefully what you'll walk away from today is an understanding of what is necessary to be innovative, what innovation really is, how you can go about being innovative, and then I'm going to give you one approach for how you might begin to be innovative inside your IT organizations. So I've defined innovation as being the invisible gorilla. I also would like to kind of talk a little bit about what innovation isn't, okay? Innovation is not the weird guy sitting in the corner that are creative and nobody wants to talk to and we can't deal with them and they're egomaniacs. The fact of the matter is innovation truly can be a process. It can be systemic. It can be repeatable. But it takes some work to get there. Okay? Innovation does not have to be disruptive. We tend to think of innovation as being disruptive activity. It's not. It can be a sustaining activity. It can create new ways of doing what you're doing today, but doing it better. It doesn't have to be a totally new way of doing things. I think one of the key things about innovation, especially today, and the rate of change that's taking place inside of our industry, is you either innovate or you die. And that's fast becoming the mantra within the technology space. One of the things that you're seeing taking place with my company along with a lot of other companies is you're starting to see yet another consolidation of what's going on. We're entering into a new world. At one point in time we had mainframes and the mainframes moved to many computers and then came the PCs and then came client servers and now comes virtualization and we all know that someday nirvana is achieved in the cloud. I always find it interesting, heaven's in the cloud and now nirvana for IT is in the cloud. Well, all of that's going on and we have to be prepared to deal with it and the way that we're going to deal with it is to be innovative. And by innovative, I'm not talking about invention. I'm not talking about R&D. I recently saw an interesting quote that said, R&D is the consumption of cash to create knowledge. <laughs> Which is an interesting comment for NASA, right? And innovation is the consumption of knowledge to create cash. And that probably is the best description of innovation. It is taking the knowledge you have and applying it in creative and new ways in order to achieve more benefit. There are multiple types of innovation. There is technology innovation. And technology innovation is not necessarily inventing a new technology. It's finding creative ways to apply the technology. Uh, the example I have up there is the $100 PC. It has a little crank. The crank generates the power. It has, has uh, built-in internet, and the whole thing is meant to be priced at under $100. There is business model innovation. Who better than Southwest Airlines to demonstrate the ability to totally innovate an industry on its ear? Product and service innovation. Uh, to this day, I am still amazed uh, I remember watching Star Trek and thinking, oh, more than anything, I want one of those communicators. <laughs> Guess what? I got one. Actually, my problem is, is I have three of them at the moment. But that's another story that we'll talk about as we get a little further through this. And then process innovation. Sit and think about how many of you have seen the old World War II movies? And, you know, um, one of my favorite when I was growing up was Victory at Sea. In fact, I can still hear the music in the background. Am I showing my age by talking about that one? No. Nah, yeah, so. It's interesting because there was one episode of Victory at Sea that it said the war was really won by the merchant marine. And it talked about, you showed them loading all of the Liberty ships and, and, and loading, you know, the cranes lifting up and dropping the, the, the tanks and everything into it. Do you realize that the technology of container ships that we have today was totally available back then? 
This was not a technology innovation. This was a process innovation, a new way to think about shipping and, and, and in particular shipping in sea lanes. And as I indicated, innovation is not just the matter of you know, the disruptive breakthrough type of innovation, but there's an entire continuum, one of, of process, one of breakthrough, and ones of game changers like Southwest Airlines was. And as I indicated, there are multiple ways to innovate. Most people uh, think innovation is the guy up there in the upper right hand corner and you him, throw him into a room and he comes up with these great and wonderful ideas. But the fact of the matter is innovation can be done in a very systemic, repeatable, sustainable process. Now, let's talk a little bit about innovation within the context of IT. As I indicated, I think the number one problem that's going to be facing IT on a going forward basis is how do we innovate? How do we take all of these new technologies that are coming into the forefront for us, all these new ways of delivering technology and creating a new value proposition for the IT department? Now, the first thing that I always uh, talk about is something that we in the engineering or, or the computer science world tend not to, to, to take seriously. And that's the fact of the matter is, we don't really cause change to take place. We think we do. We think the invention of the PC was a wonderful thing that totally changed the world. And that's not true. Change only takes place if there is an underlying economic reason for the change, or an underlying social reason for the change, or there's an underlying government regulatory reason for the change. All technology can do is enable the change, facilitate the change, or accelerate the change. We don't cause the change. And if you want to be innovative, you want to understand that because your ability to innovate is your ability to understand those social trends, those economic trends, those business trends, those government and regulatory trends, foresee where they're going to end up, and then figure out how to take a technology and apply it to the problems it's going to create. We live in interesting times, which most of you will remember is a famous Chinese curse. And the interesting time is times is taking place in the across a couple of dimensions. The first of which is the fact that some really interesting technology is coming into being. How many people have heard of the cloud? Oh, come on guys, it's not rocket science. All of us has heard about the cloud. If you go back into the computer science literature, we were talking about the cloud, although the term utility computing was used back then, back in 1964. I didn't even know we had computers in 1964, but apparently we did. A little company called GE and IBM were making them. They even had time sharing, which was interesting. But we're entering into a world where the concept of utility computing is possible. The technology is enabling what the economics have always called for. That's the interesting piece. If you go out and you actually do the study, the economics of time sharing was always better than the economics of traditional mainframe data center approaches. However, there were social reasons and there were business reasons why time sharing didn't take off. Those are starting to change and the technologies have changed to enable the economics that were there. In addition to that, especially in the business world, the users are thinking about things differently. There is not a CEO in the world who wants to have a capital investment in IT anymore. He wants all of his capital investment to be applied to assets that either create some type of differentiating advantage for them, some type of competitive separation for them, um, some type of higher value add than just doing what other people do. The other thing, and this is the most recent recession has been a true driver for this, has company, that company executives now want IT attached to a rheostat. When the economy goes bad, they want to be able to turn the rheostat down, and when the economy goes up, they want to be able to turn the rheostat up. In other words, they want metered IT. And they don't want metered IT in terms of, okay, charge me for CPU cycles, charge me for spindles of DASB, charge me for bandwidth uh, of network. What they want is they want something that linearly correlates to their business in some way, shape, or form. In fact, I was meeting with a financial institution and they said within five years, I want to come to you for a billing unit. 
And I don't want the billing unit to be CPU cycles or spindles of DASI. I want the billing units to be accounts, transactions, customers. I want a service level attached to that billing unit. And that service level has to incl include, I mean, the, the price for that billing unit has to have a service level attached to it. And by the way, I don't care about five nines or six nines or, or any of that other kinds of stuff. I want 100% availability from three o'clock in the afternoon till three o'clock in the morning, Friday night, Fridays and Saturdays because that's when people get their payroll checks and they need access to their money. The rest of the time, I don't care. So we're moving to a world of natural billing units, of energy efficiency. I want to locate my data centers in the most cost effective place I can, which by the way, if you do the study, turns out to be Iceland, just if you, you know, probably not good for us. The other thing that's going on is the rise of the browser. Now that I can get information delivered how I want what, where I want it on just about any device in the world, the nature of how I provide that, uh, that information is changing. Now, what's driving these? And I apologize for the slides. They were a little, we should have looked at them a little bit better. Uh, they'll be available so you can see them directly. There are three major macroeconomic trends which are driving this change. The first and foremost is the concept of work mobility. We have a new whole socio, we have a new demographic coming into the workforce. That demographic actually chooses where they want to work before they choose who they want to work for. And because of that, they are mobile, they have different work schedules, um, we have entered into a world where how many people, you know, particularly of my generation, we were the first ones who had to come up with the, the concept of the two career couple. Uh, recently somebody was talking about the world of Ozzy and Harriet. Well, with my generation that went away. The husband and the wife both worked and we started having things like, okay, who's taking who to soccer practice? Who's taking who to hockey practice? By the way, we have violin lessons after this. The fact of the matter is we had to come up with flexible work schedules. Now that's even compounded because my generation has introduced not this, the child care issue, but the elder care issue. We're trying to figure out how to take care of our parents as well as our kids, and we're requiring even more flexible schedules. And we're also virtualizing in the sense that people, uh, one of the goals that we have as a company is to get more and more people working at home. One of the reasons we want more and more people working at home is it turns out that it's not all that efficient to bring people in, to have them commute, to have them come to a location that in fact most work can be done interactively. Add to that this last recession in particular, introducing the concept of, of what I've referred to as the process cloud, but this whole Hollywood business model, those companies that have outsourced those things which are not critical to their business also had a rheostat attached to their business processes. They were able to cut down their fixed expenses. They were able even to cut down their variable expenses as their revenues were decreased. Well, if you combine the first one and the second one, you have an interesting problem with the, for the IT department. First and foremost, and we actually have had this happen, you have people coming in at work and saying, I'm not gonna use that computer. I've spent my entire life setting up my Mac, is generally the, the, the one who, who, who you know, yeah, I know, I work for Dell. <laughs> the Mac is generally the one that, the, that the, the, the new employee wants to bring in. They've built their life around it. They have everything automated. Now, you know, we have this wonderful thing called the iPad, which has compounded the issue. And the fact of the matter is, you're, working in, you're, you're walking into an environment where we're basically going to have the people coming to work bringing their point of presence device with them. That their work device is going to be their phone, it'll be their iPad, it'll be their tablet, it'll be their netbook, it'll be theirs and it's not going to be yours. And think about the security and information compliance problems that's going to cause for you. But it's even compounded more by the fact that we are outsourcing more and more and more of the work. And at any point in time, a transaction in your business or an activity on the part of your business could be going on in four or five totally different companies simultaneously. And the work can be passing among them. And how are we as the IT department going to deal with that? The technologies are there, but we haven't yet figured out the business processes, the managements, the policies that we have to put on top of those things. And the last of the major economic trends that we see is this rise of utility computing, or the cloud. There's a lot of myths about the cloud. I can talk for hours about that, and I'm not going to, because we're all gonna run into them, and the status of the cloud changes moment by moment. 
But the fact of the matter is the economics are utterly compelling for cloud computing and we will all be moving in that particular direction. I'm just, uh, and I'm just gonna talk about three points of microeconomic consideration, if you will. Um, and then again, these slides will be available to you. The first and foremost, how many people remember Paul Strassman? Very famous for a Harvard Business Review article he wrote in 1992, which if you were running an IT department, your CEO or CFO immediately handed it to you as soon as the Harvard Business Review article came out. It was the infamous article that said, I have surveyed the world of IT and I have yet to find any business value created by IT. Yes, now everybody remembers that article, right? Yes. Well, Strassman is still at it, and in fact, he still maintains there is little or no return on investment associated with IT. How would you like to be going to your CEO and saying, I need to spend $10 million on this project, and the CEO says, well, what's my ROI going to be? Well, my ROI is going to be uh, zero. Hmm, not a very pleasant situation. Well, then we have this guy called Nicholas Carr. How many people have heard of Nicholas Carr? He has a wonderful article, Sloan Management Review, I think summer of 2005, called The End of Corporate Computing. Cheery title, right? End of Corporate Computing, he basically lays out that 90 plus percent of everything IT departments do is ubiquitous. It means every IT department in every company and every organization is doing exactly the same thing. Which means IT has no compelling strategic value. So you're sitting in front of your CEO and you've already given him the bad news that the $10 million that he's going to spend is going to have absolutely no return on investment. And he says, well, you know, I can live with that if it's going to get me some kind of strategic value. Ooh, so sorry. Nope, not going to happen. Okay, now our friends in the ecology world have come up, in the game theory world, have come up with this thing called the Red Queen Hypothesis. And what the Red Queen Hypothesis, how many people remember the Red Queen? I mean, you can't be a space scientist and not read Alice in Wonderland, come on. In the Red, the Red Queen basically said, basically Alice had to run faster and faster and faster just to stay in place. And there's actually a whole thing in game theory and in, in, in uh, ecological science about uh, the Red Queen hypothesis. Well, it holds in our, in our industry too. And it's called what? It's called the technology refresh cycle. Now, way back in the good old days when we had mainframes, we refreshed about one, once. Every 17, seven years, roughly, that was kind of, you know, you, you, know you, you talked to your accountants and the accountants said, okay, you know, we'll depreciate that over seven years. Guys, we're down to 18 months for refresh cycles now. So you're sitting here with the CEO and you've already told him he's not gonna get any return on investment for his $10 million. You've already told him he's not gonna get any strategic advantage or competitive advantage for the $10 million spend. And now you have to tell him he gets to spend it all over again in 18 months. How popular are you? With the headhunters, probably pretty much, but not within the business. That's the world we're moving to. That's the driver to utility and cloud computing. That's the thing that says we as IT departments are going to have to get our heads out of our budgets. Didn't think I was gonna say that, huh? <laughs> we're going to have to pay more attention to the business models and the use of information in solving business problems and that is what will cause us to be innovative. So let's talk a little bit about the things that are, that are coming toward us. First off is cloud. There are more, more myths associated with the cloud than there are about uh, the last sighting of Elvis. There are only three fundamental types of cloud. Infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. Everything else is built upon the three of those. If you're talking about storage as a service, well, that's just a variation of infrastructure as a service. If you're talking about ERP as a, well, that's just a variation of software as a service. So there's only three basic forms of the cloud. There is no the cloud. 
the technology used by Amazon, the technology used by Google, the technology we use at Dell, the technology that's used by any of the cloud providers, any of the software as a service providers, any of the infrastructure as a service providers, any of the platform as a service providers is all different. They're architecturally different, and the fact of the matter is they're pretty much incompatible with each, incompatible with each other at the moment that's being worked on. So for the time being, the cloud is an end state for you. You need to be thinking about it, but it's not necessarily what you want to be doing right this second, with exceptions. Infrastructure as a service is a great way to provide services. Long term, because what innovation about is about is understanding what the end states are going to be and then applying the resources you have in order to achieve that end state. And this is what we believe the trajectory of the utility computing models are going to be. Again, I, I apologize for the size of some of the fonts. The black line is traditional IT. In this particular case, we look at, at it as IT outsourcing because that's pro the primary business of Dell Services today. As you can see, we have a lot of interest in innovating at the moment. The purple line is software as a service. That's probably the big end game. There's, uh, and we're in the current, I currently am in the process of writing an article called The End of Open Source, which uh, James and I have worked together. He knows I'm a big advocate of open source. Why would I be writing an article, The End of Open Source? Because the value that open source has always provided is being usurped by software as a service. As you have smaller and smaller companies, even individuals, able to have this tremendous reach of providing capabilities through software as a service and actually get paid for it by simple micro-billing capabilities, suddenly all of the, the traditional attractions of the open source, the gift economy, it's all still there, but I can actually maybe pay my bills doing it. So software as a service and platform as a service are probably the biggest threat to open source that there ever have been. The blue line is infrastructure as a service. Why is infrastructure as a service making that little nosedive? Well, it's making it because where is the value in IT? It's in the applications. It's in the data. It has absolute, you know, it has nothing to do with spindles and CPU cycles and bandwidth and all of those things that most of us, you know, do on a daily basis. We're fast becoming irrelevant, if you will. Now you see why innovation is important for you? And then the, the last line, the green line, is platform as a service. And you're starting to see some very, very interesting uh, evolutions in platform as a service. How many people are familiar with Azure? Microsoft calls it the cloud, but it's actually a platform as a service offering. I refer to it as .NET in the sky. Um, you will notice that Microsoft did something interesting, in particular with my company, also with a couple of the competitors. We are now going to be creating Azure appliances so that you can actually meet the needs of that touchy-feely, I have to hug my server, it has to be on my floor, I can't do this thing called the cloud. We're gonna provide Azure appliances that you can drop in your data centers. And oh, by the way, because it's an Azure appliance, it'll plug into the Azure cloud that we're building back, in this particular case, we're building it in Plano, Texas, so that whenever you need to expand or contract, you can do that into our facility. And over time, guess what's gonna happen? You're not going to care about the appliance anymore. You're just going to use the one that sits out in the cloud. Let's talk about the systems and operations business. We have a current, we, it is currently evolving, and this one is easy. I'll tell you what the end game is. The end game is a virtual data center for every single user. That's what we're evolving to. So that when I am working on whatever I'm working on, and I will get up from my desk and I hit out the door, whatever I'm working on appears on my phone. Or when I get in my car, it appears on the navigation system on my car. We're probably a little ways away from that, but you know, watching people put on their makeup, eat, do their everything, you know, why not? So we're moving to a world where all of the things that most of us are probably doing in our day job basically will go away. And what we will be providing is a virtual data center for every single user. And by the way, the reason that I say that, and I can't tell you how to get there right now, that's the difference between innovation and invention. Invention is gonna tell you how to get there. Innovation is telling you, you gotta get there and think creatively about how you're going to do that. 
I will also tell you that the applications marketplace is changing radically and the end game for the application market is actually very, very interesting. First off, we will get to something called applications components as a service where I won't buy an ERP system, what I will buy is bits and pieces of ERP systems and use them when I need them. And that even happens today. How many people have ever heard of this thing called a FICO score? Oh, surely somebody's applied for a mortgage somewhere in this room, okay? You realize FICO score really is, is an application component. This company called Fair Isaacs makes an interface available when somebody wants to evaluate you, whether it's inside their application or independently, it goes out, gets it, does the evaluation, and denies you your credit. <laughs> but that's not the ultimate end game. The ultimate end game of applications is applications will go away. What will happen in its place is you will have executable images. Those executable images will have a ton of metadata attached to them and that metadata, metadata will just, blah, 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 say that fast real quick. <laughs> that metadata will have, will describe what that component can do, what type of data it can work with, under what policies it can work with it, under what governance rules are associated with it. And then you will have data objects sitting out there, which also will have tons of metadata associated with it, describing who can use it, under what conditions, and what type of applications. And when you want to do something, you will conduct a search. And the search will match the executable images with the information objects, and that will be the application of the future. Now, how do we get there? One of the things that um, I always find amazing is companies and, and uh, government agencies, and everybody talks a lot about innovation, but going back to my invisible gorilla, it's really hard to think about innovation when you're worried about your budget, when you're worried about the next technology refresh cycle, when you're losing all of your staff to the new company down the street um, who's offering you know, startup dollars. Um, the other thing is, if you're going to innovate, you've got to try a lot of things. Okay? Innovation is driven by failure. That's really hard to say, especially to this audience, because if anybody could never tolerate failure, it was NASA. But at the end of the day, you have to find ways to do lots of experiments, to lot, lo, do, try lots of different things, and basically gain the information you need to innovate. So, how do you begin to get a systemic innovation process in place? Well, the way that you accomplish that is by establishing an end state and work backwards. That's the easiest way to do that. So, how is IT going to evolve over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? I will guarantee you and certify today that I will be accurate in everything that I say as long as you don't hold me to a time frame. Fair enough? Okay. This is the evolution that we see. Real-time infrastructure, as you heard me refer to the concept of every single user having their own virtual data center. These are the steps that we think are necessary to get there. The first thing we have to do is we have to begin abstracting what it is we do today. You can't begin applying virtualization, be it on the server or be it on the clients, if you can't abstract and define what you're doing today without getting into the, the individual specifics. Once you've begun abstracting what it is, you, and by the way, once you've abstract what you're doing today, you can start looking at different ways of doing it. You know, I, it's, it's really funny, one of the, one of the, 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 the innovation group that, that I am now heading is a brand new group. We've never had an innovation group before. And we were talking about, okay, what are going to be the, um, the deliverables of the innovation group? Interestingly, one of the deliverables of the innovation group will be the new leaders of the organization. And it comes about this way. What's the first thing you do when you get a new employee? You teach them how we do things here. What's the death knell of innovation? Doing the thing, things the way we do things here. So one of the goals I have is how do you get people to, to start thinking out of the box? And again, I'll pick on James. He knows that I have a reputation of not only thinking out of the box, I gen, generally don't even know there is such a thing as a box. 
which is how I ended up doing what I'm doing these days. Anyway, the key is you need to abstract what you're doing today. Don't think in terms of spindles or CPU cycles or this software or that software or this type of, of connectivity. Abstract out what it is we're doing and what we're trying to accomplish. Once you've done that, then you can start thinking in terms of virtualizing the infrastructure. And by the way, this is not just virtualizing servers. We have to virtualize our bandwidth and network connectivity. We have to virtualize our storage and the way we do storage. Then you can start talking about, okay, if I've, virtualized, if I've abstracted what I'm doing and I've virtualized everything, then what I can do is I can start flowing things around. I can move things around where I need them, when I need them, and how I need to do them. And then once I've started that, we run into the, to the, 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 how to describe, this facade that we within IT have maintained for years and years. And that is, we, we are probably the classic case of the cobbler's children run barefoot. We rarely invest in ourselves. We rarely pay attention to system management. We rarely think about storage management. And in fact, what we generally do is rather than automate, we throw people at problems. The real key to moving forward, and you really can't do it until you've done this abstraction process, is how do I begin applying automation? Because when you start talking about a virtual data center for every single user, you're talking about all the issues of managing and maintaining a data center for each and individual user. You know, virtualization is great, unless you aren't very good at configuration management and systems management. And then virtualization actually geometrically compounds the problem you have in managing your data center. So data center automation becomes the next big thing, followed by clouds. I would argue that we're not ready for clouds yet. We, and, and again, everything I say is, is said, said for effect. There are clouds today that you can use clouds. In fact, we've, we've been helpful, you know, we help things out with, with the nebula. Um, but clouds as projected by a lot of the industry is not here yet. Because before you can be effective in using clouds, you have to accomplish all of the things that I have listed here. The other thing in terms of thinking about it in state is understanding where the vendors are going. At the end of the day, what we are likely to see is a very few large hyperscale cloud providers. This is right out of uh, Carr. Car, Nicholas Carr, in addition to the end of corporate computing, has a book out called The Big Switch. This is directly from his ideas. But what you will also see in, is lots and lots of smaller clouds built on top of these hyper clouds that are very niche, that basically follow Anderson's um, long tail theory of markets. This is what's going to cause the end of, of, of open source. And, and I, again, saying that for effect, there will always be some open source there. It's just going to be radically different. You're probably not going to see the Apache projects rise up again. And then the middle, in the middle is a great unknown. It's still evolving. And that is the platform as a service, application componentry as a service providers. They are still in the formation. We do know that today's hardware vendors are rapidly moving into becoming hyper cloud suppliers. That's where we all want to end up. Likewise, that's where Amazon's going, that's where Google is going, that's where all the colo companies are going. And then we have today's software vendors who are moving as rapidly as possible into the platform as a service space. What type of technologies and practices are involved in this end state? Well, clearly virtualization is. Virtualization is taking a piece of hardware and making it be, appear to be lots of different pieces of hardware. Clearly cloud technology is, which is taking all of those virtual pieces of hardware and putting it back together so it looks like one thing, which I always find humorous. The Web 2.0 and the Web 3.0 technologies, how can I take and uh, totally independently developed and created pieces of functionality and bring them together into a single one? ISO 27000, the world we are moving to is only going to work if we get better at security. And it's not security as we know it today. Security as we know it today is basically a boundary condition style of security. It's also a binary. You have access or you don't have access. At the end of the day, we are going to have to figure out how to do digital rights management or digital restrictions management. 
Here's a case where we can go outside of our industry and look at things like what the entertainment industry has developed. How many people are familiar with something called MPEG-21? It's worth reading about. It's actually a brilliant digital rights management environment. The reason we have to do that is not just the security issue, which by the way is, is, a, is, is almost a fool's game. You will never be able to be 100% secure with a boundary type condition. It's, it's an impossibility. But because of regulatory and legal issues, what's going on in the world today is more and more laws are being passed requiring personal protection of information. If you will, how many people are familiar with, with the term fiduciary responsibility? If you have a bank or if you have somebody who's doing transactions for you, they have, by law have something called a fiduciary responsibility. That same concept of responsibility is now being applied in law to your personal information. Whoever holds that personal information. Now the Europeans are really getting strict about it, but we're moving into it. In fact, Massachusetts passed one of the most interesting, restric restrictive, probably impossible to implement privacy laws that I have ever seen. In fact, I, I sometimes jokingly say that there's probably not a company in the world that is not in violation of Massachusetts privacy laws right now. The Germans, particularly when it comes to healthcare, have become very stringent. How many people have seen the Apple uh, iPhone ad where the person's looking at the MRI on the, the doctor's looking at the MRI on the iPhone? That's great, you can do that today, the technology exists. If you're a German doctor and you're on, a, on, on one of the bullet trains, as soon as you cross the French border, your iPhone better shut down. I mean, shut down, because that's what the way the German laws lead, read. How many people know what is the one application that almost no company in the world runs anymore? They've totally outsourced. The one application is outsourced, almost every company in the world has outsourced. Payroll. Why is that? You know, pay, it's just an application. We can all run a payroll application, right? They outsourced it because they couldn't afford the accountants and the lawyers necessary to keep the payroll system up to date. That's why payroll was outsourced. One of the problems facing us as IT is that any information we hold about individuals and individuals' transactions probably is going to have the same problem that payroll has today. And there's not a whole lot in the business world that hasn't associated with business with individuals and individual transactions. I indicated to you a little bit before, we are the cobbler's stepchildren. The fact of the matter is we have to be much, much better at process. process. I tell V3 is only part of the answer. We got to go all the way. We got to get better at process and better at automation of our processes. BPO 2.0, that's more oriented to business people, less like a scientific community, but basically what I was talking about that businesses have found we've got to outsource more. If it's not critical to my company, I either it's not core or it does not in some way, shape or form provide competitive separation or competitive differentiation uh, for my customers, I'm not going to do it anymore. And then the one thing nobody talks about, but probably the single most critical thing to the instate is unified communications. The fact that our phones, our laptops, our TVs, our, and in fact we started using the term point of presence device, which we borrowed from the telephone company, simply to reflect the fact that I am going to have a context that I do my business in, that I operate in, and that context has to be able to move with me wherever I go. And in fact, because we are so distributed, distributed and we're working with so many partners and so much is outsourced, we're going to be totally dependent upon the communication system for maintaining the context of our work. And therefore, unified communications will probably be the critical underlying infrastructure we all use. Now, the oblig obligatory note from your sponsor, the way we are looking at this at Dell is through something that we refer to as our MetaCloud model. That at the end of the day, we have to be concerned about compute, about storing, about preservation, about securing the information. And we also have to recognize that this is not going to be an overnight switch. You can't rip out everything that you've got and put in all of this new stuff. That we have to find ways of layering the technologies and capabilities and processes and security and everything on top of existing systems. 
So someday you may have an AS400 as a service offering. You may have, and, and I'm, I'm showing the age of some of the systems that we operate inside the Dell services, we still operate mumps. How many people remember mumps? Yeah, I keep expecting to walk onto our, our, our raised floor one day and actually see a Multic system running. I just, it's, it's like an archeo archeological expedition. But that's the model that we're gonna move to. And that will then be the infrastructure as a service. And what the infrastructure of the service is really going to be concerned about is the DRM stuff that I was talking about. How do I secure access, not just in terms of permission to see or use and, or not, but in who can use it for what purposes at what <coughs> point in time? And do you have specific permissions? One of the things some of the European healthcare laws basically say is, you know, Today, if you have an x-ray, it's probably not a radiologist inside the building that's looking at it. It may be a radiologist in India that's doing the analysis of your x-ray. Under some of the European laws, that can be done as long as you, the person, have given permission for that to cross national boundaries. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, you're going to probably do that by pulling out your phone saying, yes, I give that permission for that person to do that at that point in time. But we don't have any infrastructure in place to do that today. So what you're going to see over time is this layering of infrastructures on top of infrastructures to enable the end state, and then we will pull things out from underneath. And that is what you will need to focus on from an innovation viewpoint. And it's not just the data center issue. Every device will probably be virtualized. Every device has the ability to participate in part of this infrastructure as a service platform as a service software as a service model. So clearly what your end state has to look like is one of you do it for everybody and do everything for them or they do it for themselves and you have to give them the ability to do that over time. And you will move from doing things totally yourself to a continuum where everything can be done for you. In Nicholas Carr's book, The Big Switch, and actually in the article, The End of Corporate Computing, he spends a great deal of time drawing analogies to the electric, electric industry, the power grid. And if you think about it today, I have these lights staring me in my eyes. I'm not going to be able to read anything for the rest of the day. However, the electricity driving that could be coming from Canada. It could be coming from the Pacific Northwest. We don't know, and guess what? We really don't care. Well, the fact of the matter is, we as an information industry is moving in the same direction. And as long as we understand that, then we can quit counting the basketball passes and see the gorilla walking through the room and start figuring out how we're going to deal with it. Thank you very much, and I hope you all have a wonderful conference. Dang, I thought I was going to get away without questions. Okay, any questions? <laughs> yes? I'll get it started. Uh, you mentioned a couple of service platforms, platforms as a service, software as a service, and infrastructure as a service. What are the other contracts of data as a service? Can you give us some highlights of some of your insights on that? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We actually get into a lot of conversations around data as a service, um, and it goes back to, Data as a service is one of those terms that the semantics are not well agreed to, okay? Because we could be talking data storage as a service, we could be talking backup and recovery as a service, we could be talking disaster recovery as a service. When we talk about data as a service, what we are talking about is this concept that I've share, shared with you of the information object and in all of the metadata associated information object. Because what we are probably going to evolve to and again, I, you know, and, and I'm from a vendor, so I can say this. You know, one of the problems we have with all of the semantics associated with cloud computing and as a service computing 
is the fact that marketing departments have turned everything into as a service. In fact, I jokingly say at some point in time, I'm going to go to a store and there's going to be a ballpoint pencil as a service. Ballpoint pen as a service offering somewhere along the line. Data as a service really is a precursor to information as a service, which is where I will have, for example, and the best way to, the, to think about it is what's happening in the healthcare space. The concept of the healthcare information exchanges where I have all of your medical information, you know, every x-ray that was ever made, every MRI that was ever done, videos of all your surgical procedures. How many people are going to get plastic surgery now, huh? <laughs> all embedded in this object, and then you would subscribe to the health information exchange or the personal medical record, or there's all kinds of business models. That's the other thing I sort of alluded to that you have to keep your eye on is the evolving business models that are coming out of all this stuff. That's the beginning of a data as a service type offering. That's the, the precursors of what we think it will turn into. Now, right now, something like FICO, your FICO scoring, or Experian, the, the credit reporting agencies, they're starting to have data as a service offerings they're truly data, they're not information. We think the end game is information as a service, which is these wonderful objects with all the metadata attached to it. And the key to those really resides with the legislatures of the world because they're going to define what the rules of engagement are going to be with those. So those, the, that's the one area we have to be the most careful of because it's, it's a minefield out there. The whole compliance space is a minefield. Another question. You mentioned Azure, Microsoft Azure, the appliance that's going to be released. Can you explain the difference between the Azure application and the appliance and what it's going to do between the differences? Yeah, that's still a, that's still a, a, a process and definition that's going on. And, and, and I will officially refer you back to the joint Microsoft and Dell press releases for the real term. Anything I say here I'm expressing as my personal opinion and not necessarily that of the company. <laughs> Everybody heard that, right? Okay. Yeah, well, there's a Microsoft press release that's associated with it, too. The idea is this, okay? There is some things most people won't share. If you're a, if you're, if you're a CIO, in a, particularly in a business, I mean, I, I wasn't kidding. There are some guys that actually have to go out to the floor and see their server and know that that's where that data is. By the way, it turns out that it's not just the, the IT guys. The internal auditors are kind of fond of being able to say, okay, there's the machine where that data resides on. And there is still the few people who are the jurisdictional issue I was talking about. Uh, this time last year, actually in Texas, the FBI walked into a, a colo and took out a, 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 um, a whole string of, of storage, only it was shared storage among multiple companies. And people are still kind of worried about that. So anyway, so there are still people who actually want the physical hardware on their site, okay, for all kinds of reasons. The, the law hasn't, as usual, the law hasn't kept caught up with the technology. What the idea behind the appliance is, and, and, and is that you will be able to order a machine, and that machine will come fully loaded, fully configured, everything on it that you need to be able to run Azure which means that if you have an Azure application running on Microsoft's Azure Cloud or the Dell Azure Cloud or HP is also signed up to do this, then you can take that application, run, put it on your appliance, and it'll run perfectly. In addition to running perfectly, it has the added advantage that if you run out of space, you don't have to know that six months in advance to order the new appliance to replace it. You can just basically burst out to either Microsoft or Dell or HP or whoever. There will be multiple appliances. Um, we currently have a cloud, a, a platform as a service appliant based upon the joint platform as a service that you can, you can order, you'll have that. We are in discussions with other people who have cloud offerings who want to be able to deliver an appliance onto a customer site. So really what the appliance is, is basically what we used to refer to as turnkey systems at the end of the day is what they are. And it's going to be, and by the way, now, off the official word, my personal viewpoint, it's a transition till we get to the actual cloud in the sky that we're all going to eventually end up using. The electric utility, the power grid equivalent. Another question. How are you doing? Good. Um, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that a lot of vendors have cloud services and that they all are non-interoperable and work in different ways. Um, you have a pretty consistent vision for how most IT is going to be delivered in the future by 
different specialist companies like payroll processing companies. Um, what kind of work do you think is needed in the future with regards to open standards? If open source is going to die, how is it that all the various companies, how do you get your data back from a company once they're your cloud provider for AppX? Yeah, great, great question. This is, you know, one of the things that when we, when we work on, you know, why do we think the end states are going to be, your, you know, you know them, them that don't read history are doomed to repeat it. This is a natural evolution of what has been going on from the beginning. Um, and the way to think of it, how many people remember DCE? There's a few old farts in the room, right? DCE was our first attempt at cloud computing, believe it or not, okay? Unfortunately, you did have to be a rocket scientist to use DCE, okay? Then we evolved into something which was much better, much more flexible, much more capable called Corba. How many people remember Corba? You needed to be a rocket scientist with a PhD in computer science and 300 years experience to be able to use Corba. But Corba could do everything that I talked about. What has happened is, and I refer to it as the rise of XML, okay? XML has introduced a independent way of describing things, something that can be both programmatically and human readable to describe what the data is or what the system can do or what the application component is, is capable of. XML becomes searchable. XML becomes pattern matchable. XML becomes the basis of interoperability between application component trees, the, the images that I talked about, the objects that I talked about. So it really becomes the evolution of XML. Now, the thing that I often caution people about is one of the things this new world requires is an organic mindset versus an engineering mindset. We are going to have to move to organic models of security. Ah, look at what the immune system does. The immune system doesn't keep you from getting infections. It just enables you to be able to fight it and also allows certain, you know, we have guts filled with good bacteria, right? They do nice things for us. So, you know, we have to move from engineering models to organic models. The same thing will be true in the XML space and the, and the, the metadata that's associated with these things in that we will develop languages and dialects and there will, there will be a certain requirement for translation capabilities and yes, we'll have all of the misunderstandings that we currently have as humans, but that's what we will evolve to. It won't be necessarily standard so much as it'll be a consensus building around dialects in XML uh, description language, uh, approaches. So that's how the interoperability we think will evolve towards the end state. Any other questions? Oops, she's coming on stage. It means I'm out of time. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Great presentation. Um, we heard what is innovation. It's not a nice to have. And if we don't do it, we'll meet terminal decline, organizational demise. Um, we heard about the types of innovations, and one of the things that I thought was really remarkable was on the slide, I talked about it, the types of innovation had this thing on it, it looked like a blackberry. I used to have one. I wonder what that's like. <laughs> um, and imagine the Dell guy talking about iPads, I, and a Mac, that, that was just really amazing. And one thing, Jim, the, the uh, chuckles in the audience about Paul Strassman, it predated me, but he is a former NASA CIO, apparently, I hear. Um, and then finally, we heard about how us IT people have to get our heads out of our budgets, so that certainly is something. There was a slide on there that looked like it was created by our CTO for IT, Chris Kemp, and Cliff Ward, our ITIL manager. Processes and innovation all in the same place. That was amazing. So thank you very much. Um, I want to, before we start the break, give a shout out to a member of our executive team who could not be here because he's working on a latest upgrade of technology and that's Kemp 2.0.
and uh, his wife recently had a baby August 5th, John Carter Kemp, 6 pounds, 10 ounces. And I hope that he's out there watching us. If you are Chris Kemp, give us a tweet out and let you know you're there. So 10.15, we'll be back, 10.15 sharp. Thank you very much.